Right, so different liquid elevations. This incurs a change over time. Um, effective control features. Multiple system curves for a single system. Um, problems with the system curves, the new system curves, and some standards that come from API and CHI that um, are guidances that um, are good to use as far as your uh, where you're operating your pump. So, so pumps and systems. Um, so a pump must overcome uh, two fundamental system related aspects. It has to overcome friction in the system, and then if it is uh, if it's going um, uphill, like in a situation like this, it has to overcome the elevation, um, which is, uh, and if it's going even if the elevation is the same, but it's going through a higher pressure of the discharge and pressurized tanks, it has to overcome essentially the same thing as elevation. It's overcoming uh, the uh, what is commonly called static head. Okay. Um, if they're both atmospheric tanks and they're both um, at the same level, then there's no static head to overcome. So we're only dealing with friction. Um, so, uh, and certainly there could be combinations of these. You can have elevation changes with uh, different pressures as well. So there's different combinations. Um, it's kind of easier to conceptualize uh, this one on the left where you're actually overcoming elevation. So we're going to kind of focus on that when we talk about static head changes. And we're not going to focus on this. It's the same principle, but rather than show two diagrams both times, we're just going to talk about elevation, and that encompasses this. And, and I'm going to kind of ignore that because it's the same thing. Um, which is what I just said. OK, so what is a system curve? System curve represents the head required to move a fluid through a system at various flow rates. Um, in the absence of control features, then the system will operate where the pump and system pump curve and system curve intersect. So I'm sure you've all, all seen these before. Um, and uh, you typically um, you have head on the y-axis, flow rate on the right, um, on the right, on the x-axis, sorry. Um, and uh, some people call this capacity, um, but it's basically GPMs uh, or, or whatever units that you use. Um, pump curve, uh, and when we're talking about pump curves in this context, we're talking about centrifugal pump curves, represents about 75% of the pumps out there. Um, uh, positive displacement pumps uh, certainly look much different than this, and, uh, and we're not going to really get into that today. Um, system curve here um, represents, as I said, the, uh, uh, the amount of resistance and elevation in the static head that, that the, uh, has to be overcome in order to move the fluid over that point. So where the pump curve and the system curve intersect, that's operating flow rate. So that is a pretty fundamental concept I'm sure you guys are all quite aware of. Um, so the, uh, the operating uh, point of the pump at that point um, is often called TDH or total dynamic head. Um, and it's just the head rise that the pump has to, the head the pump has to generate at that point um, in order to uh, overcome the, uh, the friction in the pipeline, in the pipe system, and then the, any elevation made, any static head. So um, the static head in the system curve like this um, is, uh, is that's, that's this part of which the pump is overcoming. It has to overcome this. This is going to be like elevation gain right there. Okay? So we'll call that HS. The other thing the pump is overcoming is the friction. So from this point up to here, this is all, all friction. The sum of the two is the total dynamic head. So what are system curves good for? Well, they're good for uh, demonstrating pumping system behavior in a graphical manner. Um, if the system curve can be determined, um, it can help um, identify the effects of the pump or system modifications during the pump with uh, uh, different speeds, uh, potentially uh, uh, over time, uh, degradation, fouling, and piping, um, corrosion, increased friction. And it gives you a visual pictorial view of what the trends are going to be in the system. Um, as systems get more complex, system curves lose usefulness. And in fact, it's not possible in some cases to determine a unique system curve. There are different system curves, but there's not a unique uh, curve. I go back to a situation like this. We've got a, a single pump. Um, with a single pump, um, I think it's always possible to generate a, a unique system curve. So you start when you start getting uh, multiple pumps in parallel, um, then you get to a point where the system curve is not necessarily unique. It, it depends on what your assumptions of flow is like. We're going to get to that here a little bit later. 
So more dispersion of pumping systems come from. Um, uh, friction occurs in pump systems due to irrecoverable uh, hydraulic losses in piping, valving, fittings, and equipment. Um, friction is also used to control flow or pressure. Um, uh, with the automated flow of pressure control valve and by mod modulating the position of those valves, um, you're introducing a, a, a controlled friction element in order to uh, achieve uh, certain flows or pressures that you might want. Um, uh, a poor Poor man's uh, uh, control valve uh, is an orifice, uh, usually for controlling flow. People use them, uh, use them for that. And then also manual throttling valves um, uh, can be used to introduce additional friction in those operating points. So it's often convenient to think of pump systems in terms of head rather than pressure. Um, head loss and pressure are related, I think we've all seen that, delta P rho g delta h, and, uh, and so uh, with uh, frictional head loss um, depends typically on the square of the velocity and the flow rate, so this would be, uh, in terms of, of head loss, um, your typical uh, uh, pressure drop due to uh, Darcy Weisbach friction factor, where the head loss is proportional to some of the geometric elements, like length and diameter, and the friction factor, and the velocity squared. Um, that's going to be true when you're turbulent flow. When you get um, to lower Reynolds numbers, this starts to break down. Um, you can uh, certainly um, uh, do some uh, substitution in here with terms um, and get volumetric flow rate in and then show that the head, the head loss is proportional to flow rate squared um, with like a resistance term. So pure friction systems. Um, for systems with pure friction, um, the system curve on the head goes to zero at zero flow. So when you look at the pump curve and the system curve, you see the system curve go down to zero flow at zero head, then um, your system is a pure frictional system. So uh, closed recirculating systems are, are purely frictional because there's no net um, head rise. And as long as it's liquid, as long as it's liquid solid, there's no net, um, there's no net elevation change um, in, a, in a closed system. Um, one of the things to understand about a purely frictional system is any pump can produce flow. You can put in a, a small uh, one horsepower pump and it can produce flow because all you need is a little bit of head and there's no elevation to overcome, so any pump can produce flow. Um, if it's a small, small power pump, it doesn't produce very much, but it can produce flow. So we'd be looking at a situation like this, no net elevation change. So either uh, it's uh, a, a transfer system with no net elevation changes on the, uh, the surface or a closed recirculating system. Um, in this case, again, the, uh, the, the pump has to over, only overcome uh, friction, so it's only HF, and there's no HF contribution. Um, when you introduce um, elevation changes, uh, then the pump has to overcome uh, that as, as well. And so what happens is, is the system curve it just basically it translates up and down vertically based on the amount of elevation um, that you're having to overcome. The friction is the same. If the elevation changes, the frictional characteristics are the same. Hello. Hi. You looking for the AT workshop? Yeah. Okay. There is a book up front if you want to grab you grab the book. Yeah. This is pump and system interaction. Surge suppression is on the other end of the room. If you want to go down there. Okay, okay. grab a seat. Um, all right, uh, so uh, the impact of the elevation changes, as I was saying, is only uh, to shift the system curve uh, up and down. Uh, certainly, if your tank is a finite tank at the supply or the discharge or both, as you're pumping, the supply tank is going to, uh, is going to drain, and the discharge tank is going to fill up, and if you run that pump long enough, then this uh, system curve is going to gradually just move up. But the, the frictional aspect, the shape of it's going to stay the same in a case like this. It's only just going to go up vertically in a case like this. The other interesting thing is that unlike the, the pure friction case, um, when there is an elevation increase, no flow can occur unless the pump generates at least enough head to overcome the elevation increase. So if the pump can't generate this much head, then you get no flow at all. Okay? In a friction system, a one horsepower pump 
and move fluid in a 60-inch pipeline in principle. Um, if, it's, if it's purely friction. But if you have to overcome some um, elevation, then, um, then you need to have a pump at least this much head to get flow. Otherwise, you'll never get flow. And then once the pump gets that much head, then you can start from there to overcome. So um, as we've been looking, uh, pump curve and system curve uh, intersect. Um, this one is a, uh, is a system that has both static head and it has a frictional head over it. So in this situation, this was a, a, a former operating point. And then we get um, a different uh, system curve, let's say, because the, we have increased static head because we're, um, a tank is filling up at the discharge. and so this system curve shifts vertically. And uh, one of the useful aspects you know, of, a, of a pump system curve is when you can uh, determine how much that static head changes, you can shift this curve up, and without running any more analysis or calculations, or if you're a thousand user without doing any thousand analysis, you can look at the crossover point and figure out what your new flow is going to be. Um, this was uh, especially useful to engineers back in the, uh, you know, certainly with the, the first 50 or 60 years of the 20th century when calculations were very demanding on time, um, slide rules, and things of that nature. And if you could develop a curve like this, then you could avoid having to go through the headache of all of that calculation. You could look at the curve, and you could figure out what happens when my static head changes or I, I add another pump uh, on the system. So, um, so that was certainly a driver for the usefulness. Um, some companies still, still depend real heavily um, on uh, I think uh, they're maybe not quite as useful as they, as they used to be with some of the more modeling, more current modeling software, modern, modern stuff, modeling software like that. One. But uh, some companies I, I know, I was talking to one just a couple of days ago, and they learned that by delivering pump system curves to their, to their clients. So it's still an important thing, it's certainly in certain industries. Um, uh, what you also see here is when we in, when we increase the static head in the situation, then we're getting a decreased flow. Um, and so the flow is going from the old flow to the new flow. Um, you can see what happened here is we uh, actually uh, we increased the static head, but we actually decreased the frictional head here, the HF. HF was based on the friction to get the, to get enough head to overcome the old flow. Now there's less flow, so that the, the contribution from friction is less the contribution from the elevation is more. The sum of those two is where we're going to operate right there. So that's the new TDH. So um, this would be a, a system that you would say is static head dominated. Um, it's one where the primary effect of the pump is to overcome static head, which is gravity or uh, liquid elevation, and also, as I said earlier, overcoming uh, pressure, if you're pumping just into a higher pressure. Um, the system curve is much more flat, and so the, the static head, the HS, dominates over the frictional head here. And that would be something like this. You're pumping primarily um, upward with very little friction that you're having to overcome. So this would be called a static head dominated system. Um, control valves are a form of uh, frictional head loss. So um, as we've been seeing here, if without the control valve, the system would want to operate at the intersection of the pump curve and the system curve. And when you put a control valve in, it, um, it's only going to be effective if you put it to the left at that point. So it's good to know where that point is. You can't get to the right at that point without additional pumping. But if you want to operate to the left at that at a lower flow, then you need to, uh, to uh, put in a control valve. And if you do that, then what the control valve does is it introduces head loss right there. Um, this much head loss it introduces and that forces the operation at this lower flow. Um, in this case, what you actually end up with is uh, the same static head. Um, the frictional head has dropped from, um, from this much frictional head to this, and now we've got the head loss across the control valve, which is a form of frictional head loss. And then overall, we have more um, head loss that the pump has to overcome at this, um, this lower flow rate. So we're going to be operating um, at that.
So um, if you have a, a, a manual throttling valve in your system, then the effect of a manual throttling valve is to uh, increase the, um, the friction in the system. So this would be the system curve with the valve open, and then if you throttle the valve, then you're going to shift this curve, uh, the system curve over. Um, it's, it's still following a square law, but now we have a higher resistance in the system. So it's a steeper system curve. And, uh, and then our operating point becomes, once we uh, throttle the valve, the operating point comes down here at a low flow. And what we've done is we have the same static head in this case. We have higher amount of friction. Introducing the extra friction throttles the valve back and gets it to operate, move operation from that point to that point there. OK, pump affinity levels. So any questions so far? All right. And I apologize, it's a little, we, when we came in here, it was a little warm when we asked them to try to get the, get the uh, a little more cool air in here, and it doesn't feel like they succeeded in doing that very well, so I apologize for that. Um, okay, pump affinity laws, I think all of us who've worked with pumps are, are familiar with pump affinity laws. Um, they're also known as homologous pump laws. Um, they're based on dimensional analysis, um, sort of like Reynolds numbers and new cell numbers and things like that, but for pumps. Um, and what they allow you to do is predict pump performance, um, where you uh, presumably measure the pump performance at a certain operating speed with a certain impeller size, and predict using these affinity laws where the pump would operate at a different speed um, or a different uh, impeller, uh, impeller size. So, um, so in general, let's see. Um, the uh, affinity laws say that the flow rate um, adjustment in a pump varies linearly with speed, and it varies linearly with um, impeller size. Um, it varies, uh, uh, the head varies with the square of the impeller diameter and with the square of the operating speed, and the power varies with the Q uh, the, of the speed and, or of the, uh, the uh, impeller. So those um, have been around for a long time from a pragmatic point of view. Um, uh, I think it's, it's generally agreed that this uh, affinity laws work a lot better on adjusting speed um, because we're not doing any dimensional adjustments. As soon as you put a different impeller side, you do have a different geometry. And you can't, it's, they don't, um, the affinity laws applied to impeller diameters don't work as well for long, as you get larger impeller size changes. Um, they tend to hold up pretty well with different speed changes. So what happens if you change your impeller size? So you have a pump curve with uh, a full size impeller, and again, you have a curve that makes look like something like this, perhaps, with our system curve. And then you put a pump curve that has a uh, impeller size that's 10% uh, less size, 90% of the, the full diameter impeller size. Um, the the uh, pump curve is going to shift downward, and that's going to uh, result in lower flow and, and lower head, and lower power, and possibly match your, your desired operating Um, pump speed changes work the same. Um, if you adjust the pump speed from 100% speed to say 90% speed, you're lowering, essentially adjusting the pump curve down, and when you do that, then you're uh, uh, getting a lower head and a lower flow as well, moving the operating point from here down. Okay, so let's introduce uh, the whole idea of efficiency. So uh, we've been looking at the blue curve and the red curve, uh, blue curve being the pump head curve um, and the red curve being the system curve. The new green curve is uh, pump efficiency, and we're, we're, uh, we have a different double y-axis over here on the right. Um, the point of uh, where the efficiency is the best efficiency is called the best efficiency point, or the BEP. Um, in this particular case, the operating flow rate is, you can see, is here. The best efficiency point is a little bit lower. So this pump is operating um, a bit higher than its best efficiency point, um, and, um, and that's good to know. Um, again, uh, if you don't push that too far, that is uh, sort of an acceptable thing to do. I'll talk about that um, kind of at the end when I talk about API and HI standards. Um, so one of the interesting things um, with efficiency is um, it doesn't change significantly with speed. Um, when you apply the affinity laws and you put all of the, the uh, efficiency is proportional to the, uh, 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 the ratio of the flow rates and the head and the, and the inverse of the power, 
you put all this in, it equals one. Um, and this is similar, uh, but to a lesser degree, it's, it's true for a color type changes. So what that means is this. Um, so if you were to draw a, um, a, uh, uh, a head um, versus flow rate curve, and right now we've got a family of, um, of head curves in here, um, that there's a particular pump operating at different speeds. Okay, 100% speed, 90, 80, 70, 60. And then what we have are the green lines are lines of constant efficiency, or ISO efficiency lines. So this pump, you can see the best efficiency point is at 82% here. And if you wanted to keep this pump running at or near its best efficiency point, you want to operate along that ISO efficiency line. In a friction-dominated system, uh, the, uh, the interesting thing that you find out if you add the system curve on, in a friction-dominated system, is that it parallels the ISO efficiency lines very well um, because they have the same uh, quadratic shape. Um, what this means from a practical point of view is if you have the variable speed uh, pump, variable speed drive on your pump, and your system is friction dominated, um, or a closed loop system, which is also friction dominated, that when you vary the speed of the pump, you're not really changing the efficiency of the pump. You can keep your efficiency at whatever your full efficiency is quite well when it's friction dominated, because uh, the system curve follows in parallel with the ISO efficiency line. So if you're operating um, at, uh, you know, this right here is maybe like, let's say, 81.5% efficiency at 100% speed, and you go down to 60% speed, you're still running at 81.5% efficiency. Um, in, in idealized, in an idealized case. But the, the, the pragmatic conclusion is that uh, when people think, oh, put a VFD in, I'm going to save energy, um, then uh, that is a, uh, uh, is a good solution for a friction-dominated system, not, not always for a, a static head-dominated uh, system. Um, a static head-dominated system would look something like this. So we got our, our system curve in, and it's, it's, it's passing through the same point you can see here at 100% speed. It's passing through 81.5% efficiency. Um, but if you, if you drop to 90% speed, your efficiency drops down here to whatever 78%. At 80% speed, your efficiency is at 60%. And you can see as you get down to 70% speed, your efficiency goes essentially to zero. Okay? So the more static head you're trying to overcome, um, the, uh, the worse the VFD is going to act for you because it is going to, you're going to get a, uh, eventually a decrease in efficiency. So you're trying to get improved energy, um, more efficient energy usage, and the cost of that is much reduced efficiency. And so maybe that won't get you better, uh, uh, better uh, efficiency at all. So, and again, if you're operating, you want to operate somewhere way down here, your efficiency is going to go to zero, which is not good for All right, so parallel pumps with uh, the, same, the same pump curves. The, uh, the uh, basic rule for how you create a composite curve with parallel pumps is when you put them in parallel, you're not getting any increased head. What you're doing is you're getting increased flow. So if you put, if this is a, 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 a curve for just one pump, um, if you add a second one in, this becomes the composite of the two, and this becomes the composite of the three. Um, it is worth noting that even if you, uh, if you, you put pumps in parallel, they're from the same, same pump manufacturer with the same impeller size, and they're all supposedly the same. You know, no two pumps are the same. And uh, I, I've gone, um, uh, Closer has a really good pump class if you want to get into a, a, a class pumps, and they have one next week, and some of our people um, here are going next week in Dallas. Um, but they had a test, uh, a power test, where they got two identical pumps in parallel, and uh, one pump is like deadheading, and the other one, if your system curve is the right shape, and one pump curve is a little higher, then you can actually deadhead one pump and get flow through the other pump, um, even though they're supposedly to be the same. So it's nice to think, ideally, that, that curves add up this way, but in, in reality, um, all pumps are different. Don't add up exactly this way, and, uh, and that can get you into trouble with pumps in parallel. If you're op operating at a uh, not a very good operating point on those pump curves, you can uh, uh, you can end up in that situation. But, uh, that's an interesting thing to see in a, in a powered powered pump lab. Two identical pumps, and you think that they would be uh, flowing uh, equal flow, 50-50 flow, and they don't. It's 100% going through one pump and 100% through the other pump. 
get one, one pump curve negative the other one. And the system curve is such that it drives them to that point. So you'd be okay with them being different because all pumps are different. Your system curve is, is, uh, is, is probably the way to shape it. Um, you can get to a point in certain operations where they are, uh, are uh, uh, not going to have equal flow. Okay, so, um, so you have a system and you put in three pumps because you want to um, add extra pumps on to get their parallel. And you know that if I turn another pump on the parallel, I get more flow. Well, if you have a, um, a system curve that's a steep curve like this, then with one pump, your operating point would be here. And you say, whoa, I want to get, I want to get more flow. So I want to turn another pump on so I can get twice as much flow. But because the system curve is steep, your flow is only going from here to here. So you're only getting a little bit more flow. You say, what the heck's going on? So you turn the third pump on, and you're getting almost no more flow. And that's because your system curve is steep in a situation like this. Adding extra pumps on in parallel are, is not going to get you more flow. Um, or not much more flow, only a little bit more flow. So um, that is a, certainly a, a value in looking at a system curve and knowing how steep it is with respect to your, uh, the operating point. Is the operating point of your system curve is it a steep operating point or is it a flat operating point? Um, the steep operating point is going to tell you that additional pumps in parallel are not going to get you additional flow capacity. Um, are not proportional to, uh, get to add a second pump on. And that's expensive, a lot more energy to get that extra flow. So that's what I just said. Flow increase is very small with additional pumps in this case. Now, if you've got a flatter system curve like this, then you can see. Um, that it's, it's flatter where it crosses over each of these uh, composite pump curves. So bringing additional pumps online is going to bring additional flow. There still is some diminishing returns as you bring uh, more pumps online. Uh, uh, because that curve is, is, is getting steeper as it goes further out. So each pump is a little bit of diminishing return, um, but when it's flatter, then you're going to get more flow for additional pump than when it's steeper. So um, let's say that you put two dissimilar pumps in parallel. Um, I think first thing to say is don't do that. It's not a good idea. Um, sometimes you don't have control of that because uh, you know there's existing equipment that you have to work with, and you, you have no choice. But uh, in general, um, it's much better to have all of your parallel pumps be the same pump. Um, but if you end up in a situation where you've got two pumps in parallel that are dissimilar, then um, the rule for adding up the, the two and creating a composite pump curve, the blue curve here, is we've got kind of an orange curve here is the, is the pump curve for the first pump. We have this kind of magenta pump curve for pump number two. And when you're operating um, at a flow rate less than that point right there, then uh, the, the magenta curve of pump two can't add anything. So it's going to be a deadheaded essentially. And the only head is going to come from the uh, pump number one because it has enough capability to generate head um, at, that, at that flow rate. Um, after you get out to uh, flow rate out here, then we can start getting, picking up contributions from the pump number two, the magenta one, and the blue curve becomes kind of the effective uh, composite between the two. Um, series pumps um, are easier and more tolerant if they're different sizes. It's not a big of a deal if you have dissimilar pumps in series. Um, the rule, if all the pumps are the same, the same pumps, is to add up, where parallel pumps, you add them to the right, each, each new pump, is, is working towards giving you a pump curve, not additional head, but more flow. What happens in series is you're getting more head um, without really generating more flow, but you're getting more head. Um, so depending on the shape of your system curve, obviously it can uh, affect your flow. But uh, the, the primary thing with the additional pumps in series is you're adding head capability to your system. Um, this is an example that comes out of a pump handbook by Karasik and other authors. And back in one of the chapters on, um, uh, on pump curves, they have this example. And uh, it's supply pump with a uh, supply tank with a pump going to three discharge reservoirs at different elevations. And, uh, and so we have this model come in Fathom. This is the results that come out of Fathom. But you get this kind of odd system curve as you get flow uh, being able to go at each one of these different different tanks. Um, and so uh, ultimately the crossover point is here and you're delivering flow to each of the tanks, but you, you get something like that. I'll show
show you the individual curves um, here uh, in a few more slides. Um, so with complex system curves, um, the flow for a system is typically referenced to a pump. Um, system curves can be generated with reference to other locations in the system. Um, and, uh, but that always seems kind of odd to me why anybody would want to do that. And so typically when people are talking about system curves, they're referencing it to, uh, to, the, to where the pump location is. And some systems, especially those with multiple pumps, and I said this earlier, they may not have a unique system curve. Uh, they can have a, a much of different curves depending on your uh, assumptions of how the flow splits between the pumps. Um, in such cases, the concept of the system curve breaks down. And system curves, uh, in my opinion, have no real value um, because it's not, there's no unique value, no unique system curve. And so, uh, and, and that is a confusion. Some engineers think, what is the system curve? And there is not the system curve. There is a bunch of different ones depending on, on how the uh, flow would split uh, it's with, along the pumps. So let's take uh, an example where we're doing tank filling. Okay. So um, what's going to happen is uh, originally we have old flow um, and we have our original static head and the friction. And uh, when you're tank filling over time, the effect of that is to increase the static head. Um, so the new flow um, is here, and the uh, new static head um, is here that we're having to overcome because now we have uh, the tank is filling and we have a higher elevation to overcome. So the curve shifts upward. Um, and because, and I did say this earlier, because we're shifting backwards on flow, the frictional curve is decreasing in this case. There's less frictional of head loss because we're operating at a lower flow. So what happens over long periods of time with system and pump deprivation? So you have your um, newly designed system. You have a pristine pump. You have a pristine piping. Um, uh, there's no corrosion. There's no scaling. Um, and uh, so you have your operating point right here. Okay? Um, over time, what you're going to have, um, and there should be no reason necessarily for the, the static head to change over time if it's the same operation. But what you will have is a new system curve with increased friction. That increased friction is all the fouling in the pipes, um, fouling in equipment like heat exchangers, um, things like that. Okay. Um, your pump curve um, will uh, often degrade over time just for usage and wear and tear on the pump. So your operating point shifts, um, as you can see, with degraded uh, uh, system curve and a degraded pump curve from an operating point that was originally here, it shifts down to a, a, a lower flow. So uh, over time, and I think that's kind of an obvious point, but as you get uh, more uh, fouling in your piping, your equipment, you're going to get higher resistance and less flow. Um, and so uh, a well-designed system is to anticipate those things and make sure that you that your system will, that your uh, system operating point, if you don't have con uh, VFDs or control valves, that over time that the original flow and the new flow will both be satisfactory for the, for the purpose of the system. And that becomes the new TDH. So same static head, increased friction here. System degradation with control valves. Okay. So with the control valve, um, you get the, uh, let's see here. Here we go. The operating point without a control valve is where the pump system curve would intersect. With the control valve, the, inter the control valve introduces an artificial head right here. This is the head loss across the control valve originally, before you get degradation. Okay. Um, and this is in the head loss, you see HCV is right here. And then of course we still have our static head and our frictional head. Um, as you get degradation in the system itself, in fouling, what happens is that's going to shift backwards, and the head loss across the control valve is going to decrease, which is another way of saying the valve is going to open further. Okay? Um, so if the degradation ever gets past this, uh, um, let me see, this uh, point right here, um, then the, uh, the, pump, the, the control valve is going to lose its ability to control anything at all because it's, uh, um, uh, it's gone wide open, and then we no longer are controlling. But over time, the control valve 
will open up wider and wider if you're getting degradation and friction. It opens up wider and wider. Um, so that's another thing to account for if you're doing control valve sizing. If you're anticipating some degradation over time, make sure your original sizing, your operating point here in the head loss, is going to allow over time the ability to, to continue to control flow over time as it degrades and the control valve goes full more, more, more wider. Okay, so this is the uh, example out of Karasik's pump pan book. And I showed you the curve earlier without these orange curves in here. But the red curve is the composite system curve between tanks A, B, and C with reference to the, to the pump here. Um, what you can do is you can uh, close off these valves um, to, and you can do this in Fathom, it's an anti Fathom model that I used to create all this. Uh, close off the valves to tanks A, B, and C and create all of these individual system curves in here. Then open them all up and you get the composite of how all three of these orange curves add together and become this red composite curve when all those valves are open. Um, this is a, actually a new feature we just put into the Fathom release last week, or a couple weeks ago on March 31st. Um, how many of you, do you guys do pump system curves in Fathom? Anybody ever use that capability? Somebody's kind of, <laughs> so Sean is kind of nodding. Um, there's a new feature that we just put in. If you do a right mouse on the uh, pump system curve window, um, and you can't see it very well, but it says show graph data generation details. If you choose that, it opens up this uh, little text window, and it gives you an explanation of every single data point in that composite pump system curve. So you can see what all the different flow splits through the pumps were to generate that curve, and how, how it was generated. And so we had a customer that asked about this about uh, last October. And so we, uh, we added that in, um, uh, just, just got into the release of that a couple weeks ago. OK, problems uh, creating uh, cur uh, system curves and, cur and composite pump curves. So if you have heat transfer in your system, or anything that changes the density of a liquid, um, your, 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 um, your system curve really has lost, has lost meaning. The system curves are based on head. And the concept of head breaks down when the density changes. So, um, the, uh, and, and I've had this happen where uh, people doing uh, an application on a um, on a, on a cooling water system, they're doing heat transfer analysis in, in Fathom, and they try to add up all of the head losses in all the pipes and make it add up to the system curve and pump curve operation. And they don't add up because they've got different densities, and so, um, so they, they won't add up properly. Um, and so uh, really, the, the value of system curve is greater when the density is constant. The more the density is varying, the more the, the, the system curve is just not going to be a, uh, a useful concept. You're not going to be able to add up all of the individual pieces of head loss to get the composite. Um, also, when you've got multiple pumps in parallel, and the pump piping is not symmetrical, if the pump piping, are, um, there's extra elbows or extra, uh, extra lengths of pipe going to one pump and another pump, um, then the flows are generally going to be uh, not 50-50, uh, because one of the pumps is going to have to overcome additional um, head loss from extra elbows or extra lengths, uh, extra lengths of pipe. Um, if the flow through the pumps are not equal, then the unique system curve cannot be created. Um, uh, the heads through the pumps are usually different, and it's not possible to say what the composite head actually is. You've got multiple heads. If you've got three pumps in parallel, you've got three heads. You've got four pumps in parallel, you've got four heads. And you want to create a composite pump curve, well, you've got four heads to choose from. And so you have different options. One way is to do averaging. But, uh, but that is not, that's not necessarily exactly correct. So, it's just one approach. So it makes it non-unique. Um, often the composite system curve and um, the composite pump curve do not cross the operating point. Um, and this will happen in the Fathom model. We do get complaints from customers who, who are used to thinking of textbook examples with a single pump. And the pump curve and system curve always cross over uh, at the operating point. So that they can look in their output and see what, uh, what the operating flow rate is for the pump. And they can go into the pump system curve in Fathom, and the crossover point is not the same. That's because uh, of this, these type of issues where you've got your, 
different heads, the parallel pumps, and different flows. And so you're trying to figure out, you're trying to take these different flows and different heads through the pumps and create a single system for every single pump code. And so the operating point um, is not well defined on the pump system code. I mean, it is, in the fathom predictions, it's very well defined. That is, that is a, a, a point you can trust. But in the pump system curve graph, um, it's, it's not. Um, so you look at a, a case like this, for example. So we have three pumps in parallel. They're all identical as far as their head curves. But you can see, um, as you go through, um, pump C has um, the shortest uh, amount of uh, piping to overcome. Pump B has uh, these T's to overcome and some extra piping. And then pump A has some out elbows and also some extra piping. So if you run a simulation like this, and you look at the fathom output, and you look at the pump summary, in this particular case, you can see, you think you've got three pumps, and they're all getting uh, one third of the flow, but you can see that pump C is generating 937 gallons a minute, pump uh, B here is generating 863, and, and pump A is generating 740. So the percentages are, uh, it's not an equal flow split. Um, further, because the pumps are operating at different flow rates, each of the pumps is operating on, on its own different system independent uh, um, system curve. So the heads are different. So for pump C down here, it has the uh, highest flow rate, and so uh, it therefore has the lowest head. It's operating further out on its curve. Um, you can take, for example, the total flow of all of these three, which is what people would normally do when they're trying to create a composite, uh, composite uh, uh, pump and system curve, or in this case, composite pump curve, you take the total flow. When you take the three heads, and what do you do? Well, you can average them, okay? And if you do that, then you can generate a data point. Um, so, and so that would look, look like this, is uh, you can take the, uh, the total flow and uh, the average head, um, and, uh, and then you would, they would, uh, and you would go ahead and do the, uh, the pump curve, and the composite pump curve, and the composite system curve and fathom, and they would, they, would cro they would cross over at this point right here. But that point, if you got down to the really nitty gritty detail, it might not be right at 2540. You get it, it might, it might be off that point. Because the 2540 is just, it's a, it's a composite of all three, but, but really that pump composite head curve, it's only know what that is, because you got different flows for the different pumps. So how to add up that blue curve and create a composite of all three, it's not a unique, it's not a unique way to do that. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So, you guys are thrilled by that. Any questions? Good stuff? No questions. Anything new you've heard you didn't already know? Hopefully for somebody? No one's going to raise your hand. Okay. All right, let's talk about pump pushing. So, uh, I showed this curve earlier. So that's the pushing point. Um, if you uh, look at, uh, for example, if you work with API pumps, and you look at API 610, um, it has um, this words in it, and it has this chart in it. Um, and so what it says is, is pumps shall have a preferred operating region of 70 to 120 percent of the best efficiency flow rate of the pump, as furnished. Rated flow shall be within the 80 to 110 percent of the best efficiency pump, the BEP. So, um, on a uh, system that looks like this, with this, um, this head curve, then a number five is, uh, in, this, in this diagram, figure 26 at the API 610, best efficiency flow is right there at, uh, um, at number five. And then the operating point is right there at number eight, um, uh, when you're operating at the best efficiency point. Um, what uh, what the, this uh, standard says is that the rate of flow should be with 80 to 110 percent. So that would be, um, let's see. Let's see the, okay, I'll take this back. The preferred operating region of 70 to 120 is uh, shown here as number two. And then they have a number, uh, an allowable operating region, which they don't talk about here, which goes uh, from a, a lower um, efficiency up to a, a lower ratio of, uh, uh, of the best efficiency point to a higher ratio out there. And uh, I don't know if they talk about that in the standard. Um, 
the Hydraulic Institute has a standard that is um, an ANSI standard. Um, this actually just was produced in the last few months. This is out of their, their 2017 standard. And uh, their standard has a um, preferred operating region, which um, varies at a specific speed of the pump. Um, so if we talk about US customary units, if you have a, uh, a specific speed below 4,500, it's from 70 to 120% of that efficiency point. Um, if it's greater than uh, 4,500 and less than 7,000, it's uh, 80 to 120. If it's greater than 7,000, less than 10,000, it's 85 to 115. If it's over 10,000, it's 90 to 110. So those are the preferred operating regions as part of the NC, uh, the Hydraulic Institute NC standard. So, um, this chart was generated um, by a gentleman um, named Paul Berger. Have you guys heard of Berger before? You may know Berger. So, um, he was, uh, and I, I didn't know this when I was actually putting together this slide for the class. I went to his website. It looks like he just passed away in the last few months. So his website is kind of like a memorial website right now. But he was kind of a guru of, uh, of equipment reliability. Um, he had a training class, Reliability Engineering Principles, that uh, um, he was real uh, famous for. But he created this chart with a um, with the pump curve um, on head versus flow, the percent of head, the percent of flow with respect to the best efficiency. And then, what he sh uh, then the, the bell curve that he has here is it basically the reliability curve. And so, the further that you operate away, the, the, the best reliability for a pump is that you're operating the best efficiency point. Okay? And so, uh, that point is the best efficiency point, and we call that eta. And then, uh, best practice of, in his uh, definition was a minus 10% to plus 5% of the best efficiency point here, and that would get you reliability. And this is not necessarily linear, like if you're 10% if you're, uh, reliability, that makes you break it down 10 times as often. It's, it's, it's more of a qualitative comparison. But in this case, you would have 90%, 92% reliability if you're operating here. Um, if you had what he called um, better practice, which was minus 20% to plus 10%, and, and that is essentially, if I go back to the previous slide, it's, it's kind of about right here between these ones as far as preferred operating region. Um, then your reliability is 53, 53%. Um, and then uh, good practice was uh, minus 30% up to plus 15%, and that was reliability of 10%. Um, and um, on this chart, you can see when you operated um, at all of these different points on the pump curve, this is what all the different uh, different things that would happen inside the pump. So if you're operating to the, to the right of the pump curve out here, um, you're getting a cavitation um, in the pump. Um, when you're operating a little tighter in here, um, you're getting uh, effects on your bearings and your seals, um, reducing the lifetime there. Um, over here was uh, suction recirculation. Um, uh, there is discharge recirculation. This is packing suction and discharge on the different sides of the, uh, the uh, impeller blade, and then um, low impeller life, um, which is uh, uh, happening as you get down uh, down here, um, effects on bearing and seal life, uh, low flow cavitation, high temperature rise to get closer to dead head. So different things that happen kind of along the way. Um, so I, I think you guys know it's kind of interesting. It's, it's always this is always ideal to shoot for best efficiency point, but um, people rarely get a chance to operate there in, in the field. Um, uh, having pumps that are operating at 50% of the best efficiency point, which essentially is like right down here as far as reliability. Here's best efficiency point, 50% is down here. Which means your reliability is like almost zero um, in, in this, uh, this uh, um, curve. Um, something, um, it's a feature that not too many people are aware of, but back in the 90s, um, some engineers um, at ITT, at Gold Pumps, they started, um, doing some quantifying uh, um, uh, uh, studies um, on different impacts on these reliability factors. And they wrote us, uh, a series of papers that they published on reliability factors. And, uh, and they used that to talk to customers about reliability of their pumps, their pump manufacturer. Um, and then it came to us, I don't know how long ago, 12 years ago, 
and they wanted to put that into Fathom, and so we did. So if you ever heard, has anybody heard of reliability factors? Um, qualitative, you've heard of that? That has been in Fathom for like the last dozen years. Hardly anybody uses it. But uh, uh, you can compare two different pump operations to get a, a kind of a qualitative view of how reliable they are. And they're in the, um, the pump summary of Fathom. You go into the output control and add in the reliability factors. And it'll tell you the reliability factors for your pump. As long as you have efficiency data, and, um, it, can, it can tell you what your reliability factors are. Um, according to uh, the, uh, um, these uh, studies that were done by uh, ITT Goals. Um, here's another study that was done by ITT Goals. Um, so um, in this study, um, they had a pump, um, and then they've got a, a magenta curve and a blue curve. Magenta is the pump operating at a, at a fixed speed, and the blue curve um, is operating at a, um, a variable speed. Okay. So this was the, uh, the best efficiency point right here, about 1,500 gallons a minute. And over here was the, the vibrations they measured in, like, I think it's inches per second um, of, of vibration. So um, with the, uh, the fixed speed pump, what you see is that the vibration is at a minimum when you're operating a little bit less than the best efficiency point. But as you get to, to higher, uh, beyond the best efficiency point, the vibration gets really high. And as you get down lower, the vibration gets really high. When you put a, a variable speed drive in, you can see that um, as you go down uh, with lower flow, that you don't that it keeps the vibration at minimum. That what that translates into is to pump um, pump lifetime. It's reliability on pump. If you're shaking it less, there's less energy going going into uh, to shaking it. All all of these vibrations is energy lost. That is basically it's, it's the electricity you're putting in for the pump, and it's it's the electricity that's going into destroying the pump. If, if, you're, if you're operating away from the BEP, all of these vibrations are energy that's not going into moving fluid. It's energy that's going into shaking things and breaking things and, and destroying the pump. So, um, so anyway. Uh, so I guess my slides are only about uh, 16 minutes worth of slides. I have some more I'm going to go to. But any questions on any of that before I go on? Scott? Great. Am I moving up your mic? Said to do that. You don't do it once. I'll do it some further. Is that better? Um, pretty much as high as you can go, actually. It's picking up a lot of the echo. Better? Maybe. Okay. So I'm going to go to um, some other slides that are not in your handout. I'm going to jump around in here and see different slides that might be of interest. Let me start up the next slide. So um, this is a Photocopy and scan of a, uh, some materials out of, a, out of the flow store training class that I talked about earlier. So I have some of my handwritten notes in here. Um, so uh, those of you who, who work with pumps frequently, um, you probably are, uh, have some good awareness of this, but if not, um, the, uh, the pump specific speed um, is a, um, you know, basically it is uh, a function of your uh, of your uh, flow rate um, and your uh, and, the, and the pump speed um, and RPM and then the developed head. Okay, um, it's interesting that it's a dimensionless parameter like your Reynolds numbers. Um, and then what people have done is they, they if you if you put in uh, everything um, dimen dimensionally correct, then it'll be truly dimensionless. But if you really want to use uh, the, the speed and RPM and then the flow rate and GPM and the head and feet then no longer the units don't all cancel. So it's sort of like um, how many feet per miles are there? It's 5280. So it's sort of like putting a 5280 multiplier into the, uh, 
uh, in the specific city. So there are some units. So when you, when you use the American uh, uh, and English units uh, way of defining specific speed, when you use these uh, inputs, and you get specific speed values that uh, vary like it shows in this chart here. So um, when you have a pump that is a, um, a low specific speed pump, then what that is, it's a low flow, high head pump. And the geometry of, uh, of the pump and power is going to be primarily radial. Okay, so it's going to generate um, it's going to generate a uh, head through uh, going through the impeller and basically uh, spinning the flow out uh, uh, all the way out uh, out to the outside of where the casing. Um, and then um, on, that's on one end of the spectrum, and that is a low specific speed pump, which would be something like 500 to 800, something like that. On the other end of the spectrum are high specific speed pumps. Um, high specific Speed pumps are low head and high flow pumps. Um, and they're going to be primarily axial in nature. Um, these ones are, are good candidates for putting extra stages on. Um, uh, those of you who might work um, in the water industry or large um, uh, cooling water systems or power plants are accustomed to uh, um, like vertical turbine pumps. And they're going to be uh, like axial flow pumps. So low head, high flow. And then as you vary specific speed um, in between, the basic of what you're doing is you're varying the impeller shape. You're, you're transitioning from an axial flow vane to a mixed flow vane um, to uh, what they call a Francis vane and to basically a pure radial vane. The interesting thing is, uh, uh, as I was saying earlier, is this is the true dimensionless form of the uh, specific speed, like a Reynolds number. Um, and so if you, in practice, if you put in uh, RPMs, GPMs, and feet, then you're basically taking this dimensional specific speed and you multiply it by 27 or 33. And that becomes these values over here in uh, English units, uh, US customary units. But if you're accustomed to using uh, metric pumps or on occasion, then they like to use uh, RPMs, cubic meters per second, and meters uh, here. And so uh, it has a different multiplier, a different specific speed if you're using the metric specific speed. Um, if you do international work, a mixture of domestic and international work, if someone gives you a specific speed on a pump, it's always worth asking, are you talking about a, a US unit specific speed or metric specific speed? They need two different things. Um, some more things I stole from closer here out of the class um, is uh, the shape, the, this is, these are dimensionless head curves for pumps of different specific speed. So, um, when you see this uh, curve right here, number one, that is a low specific speed pump with a specific speed of like 900. Um, and you progress up to a high specific speed, like a curve like seven. So um, the, the droopy curve that you see here, uh, number one and number two, those are low specific speed pumps. And then as you um, get to higher specific speeds, then you get these different shapes. Um, so if you are, um, if you're doing a project, for example, and somebody has not given you um, any pump data, um, and you know the flow rate, and you know the, the approximate specific speed, you can kind of guesstimate what the head curve would look like with, from this using these dimensional data. You kind of guesstimate the shape of the, of the head curve. Um, if you have no, nothing else to go with, um, and, you, and someone's asking you, you know, what's going to happen if I make some changes to my system, and you don't have a full pump curve, this, this would be something that you can use to guesstimate it. Um, if you uh, take the same curves with um, um, the same the same type of curve, but rather than plotting head, you plot power. Then you get power curves that look like this. Um, the uh, uh, low specific speed pumps they have uh, power curves that, as you increase flow, then the power you, you're doing increased power. When you get to high specific speed pumps, then as you increase flow, you're actually using less power at higher flows. So it seems kind of counterintuitive. Counter but it has to do with the, uh, the shape, go back. It goes back to do with the shape of the head curve. And so uh, if you're using less power, it's because to get the, the higher uh, flow, then you don't need as much head. And, and, the, uh, um, and the ratio is such that you're actually going to decrease in power. The high, the high specific speed pump. I guess I kind of talked about some of the previous slides. Okay, 
but yeah, this is worth going into here. Okay, um, the, the calculation for power on a pump is directly proportional to the head and the flow. So whenever you get a certain duty point here on your head versus flow curve, then inside that square, that, that's basically proportional to the power that is, that is being uh, required by the pump, okay? Um, and so the power, in terms of horsepower, if you use all the proper units in here, with uh, flow rate, GPM, and, head, and uh, feet, whatever, um, it is, it's proportional to flow times head. This is the gravity comes in to effect, into uh, impact and also the efficiency in here. So, but if I go back a slide, for a given um, efficiency of the pump and for a given density of operation, this is directly proportional to the uh, power that's consumed. It's H times Q, H times Q here. So to conserve energy um, use, you can reduce run time. Um, you can reduce flow rate um, and uh, close bypass resizing, or you can reduce the head, um, trimming the impeller using the DFT. Those would be some ways for us to conserve energy. Um, so, uh, for example, um, uh, a quick horsepower calculation here um, a pump consuming 5,000 GPM of water at 100 feet um, requires uh, and a 70% efficiency here, requires 180 horsepower. Um, if it's 40% efficient, it's 350 horsepower. And uh, what's essentially happening here is you're still moving the same amount of fluid at the same head. 5,000 GPM, 100 feet ahead. But between 70% and 40% efficiency, you need all this extra power. Where does that power go? That power goes uh, somewhere in the noise. It goes a lot into shaking things. So all of that power is going into basically destroying destroying the pump is what's happening. Um, and you operate at that low efficiency. Now, all the power and electricity is going in, you got a whole bunch of your electricity is going in to destroy the pump. So um, with a fixed speed pump, um, you have limited uh, flexibility in what you can do with your head and flow rate between operating points A and B. So, um, so for example, um, Let's say that you wanted um, to, uh, to move operation from this flow rate of uh, Q is equal to 10, whatever that 10 is. It's, um, you know, 10 GPM is not very much. Maybe it's, it's 10,000 GPM, whatever. It's 10 of flow, okay? And you only needed, like, uh, 7, okay? Then, um, if you, if you throttle the system back by closing the valve, then really all that you need is the only energy you need is in this, this uh, golden area right here. So you need that operating point right there. But if you throttle the valve back, um, then you are changing the system curve from this curve over here, and you have all this blue energy up here, and all that blue energy is totally unnecessary. That's wasted energy. So anybody who cares about energy efficiency, um, what, uh, what this is telling you is that you're using all this blue energy unnecessarily. If you can get away, operate at that point right there, then you can save all of that blue energy. And again, that is proportional. That square is directly proportional to the energy that's being used, unnecessarily in this case. That's with throttle control, which basically you, uh, you, uh, you crank back on the, on the valve. So you have um, all of the, uh, um, the pump sizing that was done, the original engineer who oversized it, uh, manager who put another factor on, and then finally the manufacturer, the sales rep, puts their own their own sizing factor on, and so you get a lot more head that you need, and then you have the discharge valve in the pump, and you turn the pump on, and you have to throttle the valve back right, and the discharge begins to operate where you want it to, and that's just crazy, and that's what's happening here, you're throwing energy away. Okay, um, another way to do a flow control is to um, use a bypass, a bypass valve, so you get a bypass line. And you recirc you recirc around um, back to your supply tank. Um, so if your uh, if your operation again is initially here at ten, and you want to get to that point of seven, and you put in a recirc line in order to get your flow um, to where you want it to be, then 
Now they're essentially operating way out here, and it's 13.4, and your wasted energy is all besides that blue. It's proportional to that. That's blue, that's wasted energy through the research line. The pump is going through, pumping water, and recirculating and putting it back into the, into the supply tank. Um, with a variable speed control, in this case, then you can actually match the uh, amount of energy use to the actual operating point. And so, relatively speaking, this is saying that your head rise is 7 and your flow is 7, so your power is 49. If I go back to the previous slide, um, the power needs to be this 49 plus this extra right here. So it's actually 93.8 is the power, whatever that is, horsepower, whatever it is. That's bypassing. And then throttling, going back, that is um, this 7 times this 12 or 11.7 is 81.9. And all you really need is the, uh, it's in the golden square, and that's the 49, so 7 times 7. Um, no, no excess energy is used by the system reliably, and the pump is maximized. Okay, um, what are we going to do here? Let's see this slide here. Okay, I'm going to show these reliability factors here. This is a, a pump reliability uh, factors that comes out of these publications from ITT uh, tools. Um, and so, reliability index, one equals uh, uh, best and zero equals worst, it has three components. And like I was saying earlier, these three components are um, in Fathom, and they're optional, you can use them. I've um, been in there for the last dozen or so years. Um, one of the components is the reliability factor based on um, the pump RPM, and then the second one is based on the um, power diameter, and the third one is based on the capacity, I mean the flow, um, with respect to the depth efficiency point, um, and the metric called the capacity factor. We multiply them together, we get a composite reliability index. Okay, so um, if you're um, when you talk about the reliability factor um, here, um, it relates to the RPM one. That um, this is the uh, the reliability factor over here, and then this is the uh, RPM percent of maximum design where the pump was designed to handle 3,600 RPM. And as you run at lower than that maximum design, then your reliability goes up. So uh, running at that lower that lower RPM down there is the um, is the better uh, point from a liability point of view. Um, when you um, uh, uh, when you look at the um, impeller uh, diameter here, um, then uh, you have the uh, let me see you have a family of curves based on the different speed um, and. Um, the, uh, the pump is going to rate most reliably when your, uh, your impeller is about 75% of the full range impeller size. So if the impeller could be a, a 12 inch impeller is the maximum, then your reliability is going to be best when you operate at say like a 9 inch um, impeller. Um, that's the maximum um, reliability. And, um, and then it's amplified um, when you, at higher speeds. The reliability, the impact of uh, of that diameter uh, effect on the impeller size with respect to the full size impeller um, is amplified um, as you get to higher speed. Those are the family of curves that you see there. So uh, if you want best reliability, then you're, you're, that, that would be the indication of the study that, the, that Gould's pump has published. And this out here is uh, poor reliability operating at a color of the, the full size impeller. Okay, and then you have the, um, uh, the, the reliability index that is associated with um, the, uh, the uh, flow rate and then the distance from best efficiency point. So when you're operating at, um, at uh, uh, lower flows, um, then you get a reliability curve with respect to the best efficiency point down here. 
like this, and as the flows get higher, then you get um, this family of curves. Um, you can see opera D to the right of the best efficiency point like this. Um, um, this capacity factor is a, uh, it, the reliability goes down real quickly. Um, you take the three factors, um, like I, I said earlier, and, um, and you multiply them all together, and those three give you a qualitative uh, comparison of reliability. Um, what they would tell you as far as conclusions go is that uh, the uh, slower RPM is better. 75% um, uh, of the maximum color diameter is best. Um, and if you're not 75%, then running the pump slower is better. And of course, best efficiency point flow is best. And it's extremely important for bigger pumps. So I think I'm going to call it quits with that. So we're going to finish a few minutes early. So anybody have any questions on any of those? Nope, all perfectly clear. All right, if you guys, um, if you want to uh, um, take a break here, if you're gonna come to the next session, you're welcome. Um, this one's gonna happen again, so you're pretty, pretty bored. Um, there's gonna be a sizing uh, session, equipment and piping over there, um, starting, I think we're starting at 245. So we're breaking from like 215, we're starting a little early, 250 to 245. So we should have some food and refreshments out, and so you can help yourself over there and socialize and take a break, whatever, and then we'll pick up again at 2.45. So, thanks. I'm doing the same one again. Oh, same we, one. Yeah, we had the most interest in this, so I'll do okay. it twice. Okay. And then the other side over there is sizing. Oh, sizing, okay. Yeah, uh, pipe sizing, valve sizing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sizing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 